it looks like overeating is the problem. <laughs> yes. And wrapped into those discussions is that this is where we get, we need to get really technical or at least really precise because we almost need to pull up a study and be like, what are they feeding these humans? Right? So yeah, looping true, back true. to what I said earlier, all calories are not created equally. Um, and overeating sucrose in the form of Coca-Cola is different than quote unquote overeating fruit. I don't really like Very studies. True. I don't really like studies where they force people to overeat because I think it should either be, it should just be ad lib. I don't know why we don't do more nutritional studies ad lib. Um, it doesn't really make sense to tell people like, we're going to set a caloric level for you. And until you get to this caloric level, you have to keep eating because that doesn't really mimic what happens in the natural world. If you give somebody an ad lib uh, freedom, then if they're hungry, they're going to eat. But if they're full, they're going to stop. The body has these clear signals to stop. So I like that you keep coming back to this overeating. And I want to reiterate what I said earlier, that I think that um, the reason most people overeat is because disordered brain signaling related to seed oils primarily, but also probably processed sugar. So I, I, this is probably a good time to bring up this point as well. When I was writing my book, The Carnivore Code, I had only seen literature that showed that fructose was bad for humans. And then I had to broaden my horizon a little bit later. And it was really interesting to see that. And I didn't really believe this when I first saw it, but as I've learned about it more and found more and more studies that show this, it's quite fascinating that it, like nutritional reductionism is very misleading. And just because honey contains fructose or fruit contains fructose, those do not perform the same physiologically in animal or human models as isolated fructose or fructose and glucose disaccharide as sucrose in human studies. And this to me is so interesting. And I don't think we fully understand what's going on here. It's probably other information in the fruit. People like Robert Lustig think it's fiber. I don't think it's fiber because I know that when you eat honey, it doesn't make you insulin resistant if that honey actually is real honey, quote unquote, and not just a sugar solution, uh, like a sham honey, which has a very different effect on humans. So you don't need to have fiber in the food, though fruit has fiber. So something is different in human physiology and in animal physiology. I mean, there's a really striking study in rats that if you give them sucrose, they get liver fat, they get oxidation, they get oxidative stress, and you give them honey and it protects against those things. So like what honey is freaking magical? It's like, well, I guess so. Like there's some sort of evolutionary programming and whether it's nitric oxide signaling, which is possible or whether it's something having to do with endothelial health or just something in the liver seems to shift because there's something going on with metabolism. I don't think anybody's really figured out here, but there's more information is the, the, the only way I can express it now in honey, in fruit, a whole food matrix carbohydrate, even if it's a simple carbohydrate that contains fructose, doesn't appear to be harmful for humans metabolically, whereas a simple carbohydrate in isolation, sucrose, Coca-Cola, fake honey, these do in both human and animal models. So I want people to understand that because oftentimes people will say um, honey is the same as Coca-Cola. And that's just not the case. It's just, that's been disproven like multiple times. Um, though I think people have done experiments where they look again, uh, slightly myopically at their postprandial blood glucose response and say, hey, if I drink 25 grams of carbohydrates from Coca-Cola, I get the same 25 gram response as I do from honey, which would be like a tablespoon and a half of honey. But what's happening metabolically is not always reflected in that postprandial glucose response. And I think that that's, again, leading us down the slippery slope of overfocus on the postprandial glucose level as the absolute metric when it doesn't have a good predictive value in the studies we've done.